It was Freud who most particularly established the fact that our rationality is in some sense nested inside our motivations and emotions and our unconscious mind. And I think there's no doubt that those claims are correct. Um, <clears throat> psychologists have always had an animus towards Freud. Um, it's not exactly clear why. He was a psychiatrist, he was a medical doctor, so maybe that's part of it, maybe it's the distinction between the different professions. Um, I, but I also have this proclivity to believe that psychologists tend more towards the type of person who's convinced that the primary activities that characterize human, the human psyche are, are rational, <coughs> cognitive, and And we certainly have Freud to thank in large part for making a strong case that that's not, not true. You'll encounter lots of psychologists who do their best in some sense to push Freud to one side and consider his theories outdated and unproven. And, you know, I don't really think that's fair. Partly because the literature regarding psychoanalysis as an effective treatment seems to indicate quite clearly that it's as, at least as or more effective than other psychotherapeutic schools. And it's basically showed that since outcome studies of psycho, psychotherapy have been conducted. So that's three or four decades. <clears throat> Um, I, I don't know if there are gender differences. I, I, I've actually never looked into that with regards to outcome studies. I don't think there's they're substantive. So because I've never heard much made of them. Now the other the other issues that Freud described, for example, that much of our psychological life is unconscious, and much of it is motivated by what are both implicit memory, so memories we don't really realize that we have anymore, or basic biological drives, that seems to me to be unquestioned. Um, Thirty years ago, a little more than that, psychologists rediscovered the unconscious, and they made a big fuss about that, but I have, was well versed in psychoanalytic thinking by that time, and certainly didn't regard that as particularly revolutionary, because as far as I could tell, the psychoanalysts had been there 60 years before. In fact, a lot of the experimental procedures that psychologists use to examine the unconscious are derived from the sorts of word association studies, priming studies in some sense, that Carl Jung pioneered when he was still working with Freud. So, we have a lot to thank Freud for. I mean, he also introduced and developed the idea of psychotherapy as something distinct from medical treatment for mental disorders. And, you know, I think there is room for a variety of opinions about the overall social and cultural utility of psychotherapy. I've read interesting critiques making the claim that it's reduced the necessity for familial and friendship ties, for example, as it's proliferated through society. But, be that as it may, all of the psychotherapeutic fields that are practically applied, I think, have Freud to thank for their founding. So it seems a bit on the ungrateful side to criticize him too harshly. I've also found that Freud's conceptualizations of certain pathways to psychological pathology are fundamentally correct, and I'll discuss those in a little bit more detail as we proceed through today's lecture. Now, because the late 1900s is now a long time ago, it's useful to put Freud in his historical context. Um, so this is partly history of psychology, I suppose but it also sheds some light on 
how the nature of psychiatric and psychological disorders transform with time, because you know you tend to think of them as, especially if you're more scientifically oriented, you tend to think of a disorder or an illness as something that approximates a scientific category. But the thing about illnesses, diagnostic categories, let's say, is they're not precisely scientific categories. In fact, they might not be scientific categories at all. They're informed by science sometimes, and I would say increasingly as we develop the Diagnostics and Statistics Manual, which is the fundamental book that outlines psychiatric and psychological diagnosis, particularly in North America, but increasingly around the world. Science is being used to inform the language that sits at the bottom of the dimensions along which the pathologies are defined. So, for example, with regards to the personality disorders, there's increasing emphasis, although not enough emphasis yet, on dimensional models such as the Big Five. But you have to understand that medical diagnostic categories serve a number of purposes, and, and you shouldn't get cynical about this. Often people start out by thinking about diagnostic categories as scientific, and then they soon find out that the idea that they're scientific can be criticized on multiple different fronts, and quite severely, Michel Foucault, for example, has done a lot of that, um, and his works were regarded as revolutionary by people who didn't know anything about the history of psychiatric disorders, because most of what he outlined was already known by people who took the time to know. Partly what Foucault outlined was the fact that psychiatric diagnostic categories, like medical diagnostic categories, play a sociological and political and economic role as well as a scientific and treatment oriented role and that's partly because as I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture series when you're attempting to move someone from abnormality say or ill health towards normality or health and those aren't precisely the same it's not precisely parallel lines there um, you're doing a, a lot more than science you're also involved in ethics and you can't help it. And then, you know, you also have to think about why it is that we have psychiatric diagnostic categories, for example. And, you know, some of the critics of psychiatry, especially in the 1960s, regarded it as primarily an economic or political movement that was designed to categorize people who engaged in abnormal behavior and to, and to prevent them from exercising their full rights in society, you know, because it was thought of as a purely oppressive Enterprise. Now, all you have to do is take a walk around Toronto and see all the deinstitutionalized schizophrenics wandering around, enjoying their freedom, to understand that the description of psychiatry as a purely tyrannical or oppressive sociological regime has a lot to account for. Because those people were de deinstitutionalized in the late 60s and early 70s, and the institutions have never been rebuilt, and all that happened was that they were dumped on the streets, where they generally stopped taking their medication and survived very poorly. So even if psychiatry plays a sociological and political and economic role, don't be thinking that that invalidates it as an enterprise. It just means that it's a very complex enterprise that has to span multiple <coughs> dimensions of... It stands on many different philosophical and scientific foundations. Now, psychiatric diagnostic categories and the symptomatology that's associated with them also transforms with time. And that's kind of a strange thing, especially if you think about psychiatric ill health as a biological phenomena. But language transforms across time too, and it's grounded in bi biology. And the truth of the matter is that Nothing that human beings do or experience exists in a cultural vacuum. So, for example, when I was young, a common schizophrenic delusion, especially for the paranoid schizophrenics, was that the TV was talking to them. Now, obviously, they didn't have that delusion in 1920, because there weren't any televisions. So by the time it was, say, 1930, it would have been the radio. And now, the most common focus of paranoia is the internet. And there's some reason for that. I mean, because even if the TV wasn't spying on you, the internet probably is. 
So that's a simple example showing how cultural transformation can change the contents and the phenomenology that's associated with a given psychiatric disorder. So you can think of them as being characterized by some combination of biology, biological pathology, historical pathology, pathology that's limited to the individual's experience, and then you can think of that all as nested inside a given cultural context, which in itself may be pathological or normative. And so, it's the interplay of all those factors that makes understanding mental illness and diagnostic categories a very challenging enterprise, especially when you also add to that the necessity for social control, which would be the political and economic dimension, and then also for intervention at the individual level.